during service. I greet you all in the greeting words of peace of I salam alaikum. Walaikum well, salam, salam, sir. Real simple. I salam alaikum. Real simple. It is a prayer, which is a greeting, but it's a prayer that simply means peace be on to you. So when two parties would engage with one another, they would make sure they're coming in a peaceful manner. So we reach out to each other saying, I salam alaikum. And the person who's receiving it, it is their duty. They are bound to respond at the same level or higher in comparison to the person that's extended it to them. That's their way of coming back as well saying, I'm bringing the same peace. So let's try that out real quick. So when I say, I salam alaikum, your response is, wa alaikum salam. All right? I salam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. There we go. All praises be to Allah. Now, brothers, we don't have any sisters yet, so all brothers, I could talk to y'all for a moment. So, brothers, when you came in these doors today, you were introduced with something called a search procedure. Now, that may be uncomfortable if you're not used to someone patting you down, like, hold on, bro, get up off me. What you doing? <laughs> what is this funny stuff? But it ain't nothing like that. When you go to a serious place, a place of that whole sacred things, there's always some kind of security measures in place. Have you, if you've ever been on a plane before, raise your hand for me. Okay. Well, when you go to Sky Harbor Airport, they have, and you're going to Terminal 4, they have four checkpoints. Checkpoint A, B, C, and D. And when you go there, you, you meet someone who reads over your boarding pass. That's the first part of security. Then you go through and you take your shoes off and your belts and your jacket and your hoodie and you got to take off your hat, your do-rag and all your jewelry. You take your laptop out. You take all these things out because you send it through a scanning machine, which is another level of security. If you were to go to the White House to see the president, no matter which president it is, you will go through a level of security. Well, when you come into a place like this, when you're dealing with a world where there's mass shootings, would you not want to come and be at peace knowing that you were secure when you came into the doors? That's right. Oh, I don't think I heard what I just said. We got brothers and sisters who are losing their lives right now because the security measures are not in place properly. But our teacher knew this in the 1930s when he implemented this. You also came in, and if you notice, brothers, there's... One side here, and this is nice little gap right here between the brothers and the sisters. Well, it looks like you parted the Red Seas like Moses is about to walk through right now. Well, that's all for a particular reason, too. Can I tell you a quick story? Oh, all right, yeah. look, when I was back in high school, not high school, in college, I was back in H-Town. For those who don't know that, that's Houston. I went to this beautiful school called Texas Southern University. It's an yes, HBCU. Sir. Yes, sir. That's how they trapped me. So... <laughs> While I was there, I would go attend church. And when on my way to church, I would get up that morning and say, you know what? I want to hear the word of God today. I got the right intentions. I got a Bible with me. I drive to one of the churches. I get out the car and I walk. And I don't know if you've ever been in Houston before. Some beautiful women in Houston. Let me, I got to put that out there. Yes, sir. And I will walk in. And I'll say, ooh. I'll turn right back around because I saw a nice little honey dip. Yeah, just disregard the, the choice of words. And I will go put my Bible back. Then I will go and try to sit next to that beautiful woman so that I can read off of her Bible. Was that my intentions when I went to church? No, it was not. So imagine if you came into the mosque and you saw this beautiful woman with this nice crown over her head, which is a headpiece, and this nice, beautiful white garment on. You're like, man, she is fucked. Now let me be careful before I get myself in trouble. And you try to find yourself sitting next to her. Nah, brother, we ain't playing that today. Your intentions are off. So when you came in today, you came in looking for the word of God. We want to make sure we keep your focus there. Now, as well, when you stood up today, you were actually facing the east when you made your prayer. And if you paid attention, you had your head slightly bowed, feet at a 45 degree angle, hands extending out, looking to receive a gift. Well, when you were facing the east, you're actually facing and turning your back against darkness. Well, if you're turning your back against darkness, what else do we know that's considered darkness? Evil. So you're turning your back against evil and turning towards light, which yeah. means you're turning towards the wisdom of God. Yeah. And if you study any scripture in all, and, and you look at the three holiest cities, Mecca, Medina, and Jerusalem, those are all in the east. So you're actually facing the east and asking God to give you the light of understanding and showing you the path in which you want to go. So when you stood up today, 
and you made that prayer, you were making a prayer asking God to give me guidance and show me the right way. Well, brothers and sisters, as we continue on this program, I want to introduce you to one of my sisters. I love it when I hear this sister because this is not just a studious sister, but this is a sister who delivers the word of God with such grace. And you will see how she has been in her studies for so long. Hold on, that, that sounds that sound old, so let me not say it like that. But she came in at a young age. And in her young age and, in the young, and, and within her studies, this is a sister who used to work in the bookstore. And when she was in the bookstore, all she did was listen to the word of God all day. When those books would come in, she would be reading through the books all day. So when a customer would come in and ask about the book, like a great librarian would do, she could point you to the right knowledge you need. So brothers and sisters, help me bring to this podium my dear sister, student minister Aisha Muhammad. as alaikum. In the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful, we forever thank Allah for appearing in the person of Master Fadi Muhammad. We thank him for leaving with us and raising one from among us, the most honorable and honored Elijah Muhammad, whom we now know is the great Messiah. We thank him and we could never thank him enough for preparing one in this hour knowing that we would not accept the most honorable Elijah Muhammad as we should. He has prepared one who is the second Messiah in our midst, the Honorable Louis Farrakhan. So I greet you in our nation's greetings of peace, which is not a foreign language, but actually our original language of Arabic. Assalamu alaikum. Brothers and sisters, I would like to begin with something. First of all, I would like to thank Allah and thank the Honorable Louis Farrakhan and our local minister here for allowing and giving the sisters an opportunity to speak from the feminine side of God. I would like to begin with uh, Surah 15, verse 39. And this is a conversation between God and Satan. And Iblis, who he is termed as, he said, My Lord, as thou hast judged me erring, I shall certainly make evil fair seeming to them on earth, and I shall cause them all to deviate, except thy servants from among them, the purified ones. But listen to Allah God, because he goes gangster on him. <laughs> he says, this is a right way with me as regards my servants. Thou hast no authority over them except such as the deviators who would follow thee. So, you know, when we look at this, we see that Satan is bold. You know, and he is... He has the same kind of personality sometimes that we have when we get caught doing wrong. Yeah. You know, we don't want to accept the correction, but we'll start telling you about all the wrong that you're doing, yeah. and we'll try to catch someone else in the same circumstance. But as I was looking at this, it brought back something to me, and as I looked at just the simple words, if you define the word erring, which means wrong, it is having failed to address to, uh, or adhere to the proper or accepted standards. Fair means in accord with rules or standards. And seeming, because he said that it would be seemingly appearing to be real or true, but not necessarily in accord with rules or standards. And you know, that is what we are faced with today because we are given circumstances by the enemy that if we look at the circumstances just on face value, we may actually misinterpret what we're looking at. And I'll give you an example in a minute. But you have to ask yourself, why does Satan have to use deceit or subterfuge in trapping us up? Well, one of the reasons is the nature of the original man and woman is 
to do right. That's right. The most honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us that our brain is actually created to think right. Mm -hmm. So in order for us to do wrong, someone has to make us think that it is right. Mm -hmm. The most, the honorable Louis Farrakhan in our study guides, he calls this deceptive intelligence. Mm -hmm. Before we can actually do something wrong, brothers and sisters, we have to actually internalize and make ourselves believe that it is correct. Now, I might be able to give you an example of this. I know right now what is in the news is this whole law or laws about Roe versus Wade. And for those of you who don't know what that is, that is the hallmark decision that was made by the Supreme Court to protect so-called the liberty of a pregnant woman to have an abortion. Now, the brain of the original man and woman, if someone just, if he just came out and said, we're going to put a law in action that you can actually murder an unborn child, you know, we would not go along with that. But what they do is they divert and change the subject. So the subject has changed from population control, which is what it is, of the original people, and they change it and mask it to freedom and liberation of women. Yes, so isn't that what you've been hearing, is that when you listen to Gloria All Right, All Red, and All Wrong, <laughs> who is a supposed feminist and speaks from the feminist point of view, then it might sound like someone is trying to tell you what to do with your body. Well, when you really look at it, God has already told you what to do with your body. That's right. And that's what you should have said to the man before he even made that proposition, that's right. that this is my body and I know when to commit to a serious relationship and one who has a strong uh, commitment in mind for me and not just someone who's going to be there for a minute and then he's gone, especially when you're talking about the birth of a child. But are we also looking at something that we call free will? And when you look at free will, you know, you have to ask, is it free will or is it God's will? In the study guide, this study guide, Building the Will, which we had, I think, four, building the will, one, two, three, and four. So we know that this is extremely important that we learn how to build our will. The Honorable Louis Farrakhan says, according to Webster's Dictionary, it is the faculty of conscious and especially of deliberate action. So that means that it's what premeditated, as we say in, in criminality. But the Honorable Louis Farrakhan said that there is no action that is not preceded by a conscious thought. So, you know, when you look at the will and how it is important for us to build the will, I was looking at something in our book that the Minister Jabril Muhammad wrote, and it is an extremely important book. I would hold it up, but I have three books and none of them have a cover on them. <laughs> but I would ask that you uh, go to finalcall.com and purchase this book and also the self-improvement study guides. But one of the comments that the Honorable Louis Farrakhan makes, he says, obviously people are presently living their lives throughout America and in every part of the earth according to how they choose. But how many of them are living their lives according to the Supreme Being's perfect understanding of the root meaning of the universal order of Allah's creation in which they were born and are living their lives? How much longer will he allow this? And he answers his own question. He says, not long. So many of us, we talk about, you know, the kingdom of God and 
Christians say that they're getting ready for the second coming of Christ. But are we seriously getting ready? You know, I was speaking with a Christian the other day, and it's just, it's interesting how even though as adults, they have given us a fairy tale in the Bible, and he was talking about, well, you know, all of this is due to what they call the universal sin, and that is going back to the Garden of Eden where Eve is talking to this serpent, and the serpent convinces her to eat the apple. Well, you know, the minister says, first of all, no woman is going to sit and talk to a serpent, especially if he's a talking serpent. <laughs> so we know that this is a metaphor, and it is actually representing a different set of circumstances. But what the Christian was saying is that they can lay sin at the door of the first Adam and Eve. And I said, well, you know, sin is not something that just jumps on your back and decides to follow you around. You have to make a decision to sin. Yeah. Right. So we have to accept the responsibility of our actions and realize that we have to build up our willpower. Yes. The Honorable Louis Farrakhan says, will is the power of control the mind has over its actions. Yes. So the more that we develop the will, that's one of the reasons why we fast. That's right. If we can turn down food, we can turn down sex. Yes. We can turn down anything that is against you know, our benefit. So brothers and sisters, I am not the main speaker for today. And we're very happy to have a brother who he said he started out in Houston, Texas. And from what I understand, he moved up to the ranks from lieutenant. And he is here now as a young man developing in uh, the teachings of Islam. He is a father, a husband. He is also assistant minister here at Muhammad's Mosque number 32. So let's bring him on with a warm round of applause, our brother, student minister, Hannibal Muhammad. As I leave you, Assalamu alaikum. Again, in the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful, I bear witness that there is no God but Allah who came in the person of Master Fark Muhammad, the great Mahdi. I bear witness that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is the exalted Christ and living Messiah. And I further bear witness that the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan is a divine reminder, wonder and I miss. And I want you all to understand as a 38 year old young man, I did say 38. Yeah. I'm almost 40. Yes, sir. Catching up. <laughs> as a 38 young 38 year old young man, I would not know the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, nor Master Fat Muhammad, if it was not for the Honorable Minister Louis That's Farrakhan. Right. That's right. You know, our pioneers went through a lot prior to 75. Yes, sir. So imagine I was born in the 80s and a whole bunch had happened before I was even born. Yes, sir. And the most, the closest I get to it is the stories that are told. Yes, so to be in this dispensation, striving to the best of my ability to show honor and respect to those who I stand on the shoulders of. Yes, sir. I would not know of these two men if it was not for that man, because that man went back and got these brothers and sisters yes, for him. Yes, so I greet you all again with the greeting words of peace of I salam alaikum. Well, 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 Before we get started in this message, and today we'll be teaching on the subject, a legacy beyond the grave. As you all know, there's been a lot of transitions in our nation of Islam. Yes, sir. So before I can get started on this message, there's a few things I want to do. And what I want to do is take this moment and I want to salute those soldiers who made their transitions in the work of Allah first. Yes, sir. Because I know they're due that. And if we go to the Holy Quran, Surah 2, which is a chapter, when you hear me say Surah, that's chapter 2, 154, and it says, and speak not of those who are slain in the law's way as dead. 
Nay, they are alive, but you perceive not. We may have lost brothers and sisters in the ranks, but we've also lost brothers and sisters, friends and family, so I want to salute them too. Yes, sir. Martyrs. Because those are people who had impact in your life yes. that you can't go back to and physically touch them. That's right. But you can live life on knowing that they physically touched you and they had an impact in your life. So in the Holy Quran, chapter 3, 168, and it says, And think not of those who are killed in Allah's way as dead. Nay, they are alive being provided sustenance from their Lord. So brothers and sisters, today we want to take on a subject, a legacy beyond the grave. Because our brothers and sisters only die if we allow them to die. Yes, oh, no, I don't think y'all heard what I just said. Yes, sir. Our brothers and sisters, our mothers, our fathers, our grandparents, our children, our siblings, they only die if we allow them to die. Yes, because if we allow them to have the true essence in us that they were striving to give us, Hannibal, what do you mean by that? There was a word they said to you at one point that you argued with. There was something they kept beating on your head about that you didn't want to listen to. But as you start growing in life, you start having what they, what they call aha moments. Right. Oh, that's what Nana was trying to tell me. That's what my brother was trying to tell me. And at that moment, they become alive in us again. Oh, man, y'all don't hear me today. Y'all don't hear me today. Brothers and sisters, I want you to understand, a life not remembered is a life not lived. Right. Right. Yes, I'm going to say that again. A life not remembered is a life not lived. Yes, Are we living our lives today showing our brothers and sisters, showing our family that they didn't lose their life in vain, but that they lived their life through you and me? Yes, right. How will you and I be remembered today? How will we be sketched in stone when our time comes? What impact will you and I have on our family, our community, and our nation? What legacy will you and I live behind? I get it. I'm only 10. I'm not thinking about my legacy. But young brother, you are. Everything you do today is the impact of what your legacy will be like when you get older. There's young brothers like Tamir Rice who did not make it to be a teenager, but he's the legend today. That's right. We speak highly of his name. Yes, sir. So the things we do today, whether it's through the permiss of Allah or whether we do it to ourselves, that determines how our legacy is remembered. That's right. See, transitions, transitions from life into death, what it does, it brings something out of the living. How many times have you been at a funeral or a janazah and now you have to reflect on your life? Right. See, funerals is not for the dead. Funerals right. for the living. Exactly. We go to funerals and we give flowers for what? They can't smell them. But we give them to show the beauty of that person. Yesterday, we were blessed to go out and be in the community. Yes, sir. And through the grace of Allah, I was blessed to be on the panel. But one of the things I pointed out was how beautiful the MGT, hold on, y'all yes, may not know what MGT is, yes, sir. the acronym means Muslim Girls in Training, yes, sir. and then they have GCC, General Civilization Class, these are the women of Allah, oh man, yeah. yes, sir. these are the women of Allah. These are the women who are striving to grow into oneness with their high being, their supreme being, their God. So they come out of death into life because they love the sisterhood. Oh, I flipped that on you. I wasn't expecting that one. So through the grace of Allah, they came out wrapped. Ooh. They came out wrapped in pink robes. Yes, sir. They had pink garments on with a pink crown from head to toe. Yes, sir. Then you saw a little sprinkle of beige in there, a little sprinkle of blue in there. And if you were to wrap that around some green and bring it to someone, that's a bouquet of flowers. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, God. Yes, sir. Praise be to Allah. 
To give flowers means you are giving what? Life to someone. Yes, sir. So when you transition from death, the living looks at death and says, whoa, how do I learn from this person that I don't make the same mistakes? Yes. What do I learn from this person that I can use the impact they had on my life and I can carry them on through my life and impact my seeds with them? Yes, sir. Transitions help us also brings us closer to God. How many of you have lost somebody in your life? I mean, I'm expecting everybody had to go up at this point. It was painful, wasn't it? It was painful. And people came and they, they, they did the best they could. They gave you a word. You know, through difficulty comes ease. I don't want to hear that right now. They're trying their best to give you something of comfort, but the only comfort you can get is through the Most High God. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. At the end of the day, God ordained that to happen. Yes, sir. Just like with Job and how Job lost everything, they wanted him to denounce God. And he went to God and asked God for understanding. That's all you have to do. God, just give me some understanding. He may not come out and say, all right, all right, Brother Hannibal, here's the understanding right here. No. But as we continue to move through life, we will start seeing why is it that God did certain things because sometimes he has to remove that one who he loves from us so that he can bring us up closer to him so we can be who we're best, we're destined to be. Sometimes we don't find our purpose because we sit up under somebody else's purpose. Oh, y'all didn't hear that. Y'all didn't hear that. Sometimes we don't find our purpose because we sit up under somebody else's purpose. Sometimes we don't become the man we're supposed to be until we move out of mama and daddy's house. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking personal now. I didn't understand what it was like to pay bills until I moved out. I had to call back. Yo, mom, I get it now. I see what you mean. Whew. Yeah, my bad. I'm sorry I was running your electricity. I'm sorry I used to smoke up the kitchen trying to make food all day. Please forgive me. But that allowed me to grow to be a man. I mentioned Texas Southern earlier. When I moved on to college, I had three roommates. Then I moved to just me and one of my boys. And then when I moved on to my own place, I looked back and said, why didn't I do this in the first place? <laughs> because I was afraid. I was comfortable being around people. I wasn't ready to be around myself yet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the only person we can lean on is God. And God helps us to grow to who we need to grow into. So I want you to understand that before the time you were born, you were being created to be great. That's for the young brothers and sisters. Yes, I want you to know that. Yes, you may not see greatness in yourself yet, but I want you to know you were born to be great. Before your mother and your father even knew they were pregnant in the womb with you, God was there. Yes. Mother's womb. God, God sparked a certain urge between your mother and your father because he knew he wanted you. Oh, man. See, so there's no reason for us to be insecure about ourselves. When God, man, come on, man. There's billions of sperm who are racing in that universe of life trying to get to an egg so that they can come into this world. And you made it. And the other died off. Yes, sir. You fought against those to be here, but now you're dealing with suicide? Oh. Yes, sir. Now you don't want to be here, but you 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 beat them to be here. Yeah. Oh, man, that wasn't part of my subject, yes, but a lot of us took that one out. <laughs> that, that needed to be said. Yes, sir. You are destined to be great. You are, listen to what I'm saying here. You are destined to be great. I don't care who comes and tries to plant a seed in you and tries to speak negative words or evil suggestions in your ear. The fact that you're taking a breath today, the fact that you're standing on your feet today, the fact that your hands are working today, that means God brought you here to be great. Yes, and if we go to Psalms 127 
7 and 3, it says, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb, a reward. There are women today who would love to have children. But the Lord did not bless their womb with the seed. But Allah blessed your mother's womb with a seed that you could be in. But we speak negative of our mother. We argue with her in the house. We give her a hard time. We misbehave in school. We misbehave in places. And she doesn't know how to handle us, young brothers. Because we, we got a little hair in some places and we think we grown now. But she went through hell to get you here. The pain, the sorrow, the hurt, the love, the yearning is why you were here today. There was a yearning for you. It may not have been the name that God had for you, but there was things that happened in life. There was pain that happened in life, and they were calling and yearning for something. And through the annals of time, God would plant seeds and different men and women that they would give birth to a child. Go ahead. That that child will be great, and that is each and every one of us. I have friends who, who died because they were in gangs. I have friends who were murdered at grocery stores and gas stations. I have friends who were locked up in prison for life. But God allowed me to be here today, and I was with most, most of them at the time it happened. So how dare I not be great when they left so I could be great? If we go to Jeremiah 1 and 5, it says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I dedicated you. And I appointed you a prophet to the nations. But brothers and sisters, you are more than a prophet. Uh-oh. Hold on, brother. What are you trying to say? What, what, what do you mean by that? I mean, what the prophets dealt with in the scriptures ain't nothing what you deal with today. The prophets will go, the prophets, if they walked into this world, they would turn around and run. No, I'm good. God, you got to have this on your own. So don't, don't, don't belittle the struggle that you go through and think that you're less than. You are much more than what you see yourself as. Now, we don't walk around in arrogance. We walk around humility, being thankful to God for making us who we are. Those trials and tribulations we go through, there's a reason for it because it brings something out of us. It shows a weakness that we have in us that we must work through. You are a child of God. You are a child of the Most High God. So if God is your father, y'all walk with me for a moment. I want, I want, I want to paint a quick picture. Picture, no, don't picture your father, because some of us may not know who our father is, so I ain't going to do that part. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He walked out when I was two. <laughs> if God is your father, which he is, and you are his son, and you are his daughter, what does that make you? If you see a tiger, well, we saw a tiger, we probably take off running, but if you saw a tiger and a whole bunch of tiger cubs, what do we call those little cubs? Tigers. If you saw a turtle or a duck and you saw a whole bunch of ducklings, we know those are ducks. So if God is our father, what does that make us? There you go. That makes us gods. But we're not a god with that big G. We're a god with the little G. We a little god looking up at God saying, dang, God, look at you move. A child yearns to be around his father. A child just wants to get the acceptance of his father. Well, what acceptance are you learning? Mm. What acceptance are you trying to get right now? Are you trying to get acceptance of your friends? 
acceptance of your, your boy, acceptance of your girls, and acceptance of what social media says acceptance should look like. But what about the acceptance of God? And if we accept that we are little gods to the most high supreme God, then that makes us above a prophet. Ooh, so you brought that back around? Uh, all, right, all right, all right, let me make it a little easier. I, I, I feel like, hey, look, let me make it a little easier. Let me make it a little easier. Watch this. Put your hands up if, if you play spades at any point in time in your life. Yeah, I know them hands was about to come up. All right, all right. Let's, let's, let's run this through a hand of spades real quick. So we're playing spades. Somebody drops a king of clubs. Somebody drops, even though this, this doesn't, it doesn't work completely like this, but I want to paint the picture. A king of clubs, a king of hearts, and a king of diamonds. But you don't have any of those, but you have a deuce of spades. Mm -hmm. who, gets that, who gets that book? The deuce of spades spade gets that book, right? right? So even though we look at prophets the way we look at prophets, and we look at ourselves as little gods at the end of the day, we are like the deuce of spades. We trump all of it. Yes, so as little gods striving to grow up to the most high God so that we can be honorable to him, Everything around us is subservient to us. The sun, the moon, the stars, subservient to you, brothers and sisters. The mountains, the birds, the bees, subservient to you. We are the only of God's creation that he gave the free will to maneuver how we want to maneuver. If the sun decided at one point in time just to deviate a little from the will of God, it would end everything. The same thing with the moon. The birds don't, the birds don't bark while they're in the sky. God gives us the free will because God is free will. Y'all didn't hear what I just said. God gives us the free will because God himself is free will. So he allows us through this whole universe to make bad decisions so that we may learn from our decisions and he'll allow us to go and bump our heads and he'll sit back and be like, you ready to come home now? <laughs> we go out in this world and we do stuff that we say, man, I got to come back home. And then when we come back, we find ourselves ready to give our works and our life to God. I, are y'all with me? Absolutely. Okay. God used your mother and your father as agents to reproduce life. So when you're a baby and you're crying out, you're crying out to God. Y'all don't hear me. I don't want to make the sound because I don't want y'all laughing at me. <laughs> but when you cry out because you're hungry or you need your diaper changed, somebody comes to answer that prayer. And who usually answers that prayer? The mother. So for you, your first God is your mother. Because that's the first person you're leaning towards. And then as your mother develops you in rage, you start seeing the imperfections of your mother. You start leaning towards your father. You see the imperfections of your father. And now you're on a journey, a search for who is God. Yes, and then once you find who God is, you don't disrespect your mother and your father, but you pay homage to them for leading you to the supreme being. Allah, Allah. So if we go to John 16 and 21, it says, when a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. That sorrow brings pain. Those labor pains are a sign of the struggles of life that you and I will endure as we grow up in this life. And each, and each level of that labor, those labor pains are degrees of pressure we will endure as we go up in life. Are y'all with me? Yes, sir. Okay. I just want to make sure I ain't, I ain't leaving nobody right now because I'm trying to keep this simple. These are signs of the pain the struggle, and the pressures we will endure in life. So everything you went through and everything you're going through now, you experienced it once in the womb with your mother. And your mother bared her life. 
Some mothers don't even make it after the birth of the child. Your mother goes to death's door so that you can be here, so that you can be a true agent of God and to fulfill your purpose in life. Your mother's and father's purpose is to produce you so that you can go beyond them and that becomes part of their legacy. Mm -mm -mm. So as a child, we are innocent of this world. Our minds are sponge looking to soak up everything around us. We're having fun learning and discovering new things. Hmm. And as a child speaks of our purpose, or as a child, we used to speak of our purpose. I don't think I heard what I just said right there. If we were to go back through our memory bank, we will find that purpose God showed us as a child. If we were to honest to God, go back to when we were a child moving freely. For those who were at the event yesterday, you saw our sister Zoe. She was on a panel. Her young son was over in the corner with his phone just having a good time. The innocence of the child. We, didn't, we did not want to disrupt that because if we disrupt that, that disrupts his progress in life and he's afraid to express himself because he was constantly being told to be quiet. And many of us have experienced that growing up, constantly being told to be quiet or sit here, don't move, don't do this. So at some point, we're afraid to even do anything because we've been taught not to do anything. And that becomes our legacy. So you will see things that inspire you and things that made you happy as a child if we go back and look at it. Life, life itself has robbed us of that purpose. Bad seeds being planted in us by people have robbed us of our purpose. The pressure changed our direction that we were going into because the environment around us did not cultivate our purpose. So wanting to fit in with others distracted our focus. Now we're here as adults looking back at what we want to be as children. Upset because we're nowhere where we want to be at in life. Y'all don't get mad at me. I'm just pointing out some things. We become too busy trying to survive this world. Too busy trying to survive our day to day. Too busy working nine to fives with no time for our family. Just trying to pay bills just so we can survive. So we become too busy to even look. To even put any energy into our purpose in life. When was the last time you invested in yourself? been a while, huh? I got to make sure my children take care of. I, I, I got to cook dinner. I got I to make sure these bills are done. I got I got to go here. I got to pick this up. I got a soldier here. I got. But when was the last time you invested in yourself? We make sure everyone else is taken care of, but we negate ourselves in the process. Do you remember when you were a child? You were fearless. I mean, I remember when I was a child, I used to do backflips. I probably could still do one. Might be a little crooked when I, when I take off. But I used to do them back tucks like it was nothing. And we used to start off on a chair. Uh, yeah. Then we went to the bleachers. Yeah. I mean, I was doing tucks off of roofs. Ask me to do a tuck off a of roof. Nah, nah, bro, you tripping. Nah, good on that. We were fair. We didn't think about breaking bones. We didn't think about getting injured. And then, you know, the way I grew up, you got hurt. Man, go clean up, put a band-aid on, go back outside. If we ain't got to go to the emergency room, you good. Lay down for a moment. Drink some water. Here's some rubber tussin. <laughs> but when we were children, we were fearless. But something happened. Life happened, and we lost that fearlessness, and we became afraid to do things in life. So some of you are struggling right now. Some of you are struggling with your identity and, and you're attaching yourself to anything that sounds good or anything that's trendy. 
Some some of us have become over some of us have been overcome with fear. It reminds me of the children of Israel, the adults, the elders in the children of Israel. And they told God, "No, no, no, no. There's giants out there. There's giants out there. Go go clear the giants." And what did he do? He let them sit there and wander until another generation will come. You don't want to be that other generation. You don't want to be the one out there wandering, waiting for another generation to come. We become afraid to explore life. And that a fear creates a spirit of regret. So what do we find ourselves doing? Lashing out at people. We get upset when we see other people doing things that we know we should have been doing. Oh, you can't do it? Dang, brother. Really? You can't do it for real, sister? Dang. At least let me go try. Let me go figure it out. Maybe I can bring back some good news for you. And I saw that you were trying to do this. I figured out how we can get it done. I got us to this point. Maybe you can help me get us further along. So what do we find ourselves doing? Killing the spirits of others. We become the enemy to ourselves and others. That becomes the legacy we, be, we leave behind someone who had regret and wanted to keep others from being great. But it doesn't have to be that. And it's not too late. If we go to Luke 19 and 10, it says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. The Son of Man. Who is the Son of Man? Let me clear the air right now. The Son of Man is the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Let me put that out there now. The reason why you're here today is because the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan stood back up. This is the same man who can speak to the cradle and to old age. This is the same man who can speak in the masses come and hear. This is the same man that your enemies who don't like you will not speak of him, but they they behind closed doors listening to him. This is the same enemy that would come to you at work and say, did you hear that man Farrakhan? Oh, you heard him? I thought y'all didn't like him. I don't like him. I don't like him, but you was listening. Because they know who he is, but they don't want you and I to know who he is. Because they know we understand who this man is. It will change our life overnight, and we'll be better brothers and sisters. See, this enemy loves it when we're divided. Because as long as we're divided, they can conquer us. As long as they can have us whispering negative things about each other, they know we'll never unify and work together. So our Latino brothers beefing with the blacks, the blacks beefing with the Latinos, the Latinos and blacks beefing with the Asians, the Asians beefing with our brothers and sisters in the Caribbean, but we all being beefed and being mishandled by the same white man. Yes, sir. But we don't see it because we've been taught not to like each other. Mm. Mm -mm Mm-mm-mm. So, if we go to John 3 and 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So, in in this beautiful book, and and it doesn't look beautiful because I I put a lot of work into this book right here. (laughs) I got a whole new one, but, you know, when you got that one you work with, you know, you got one you worked with, it's kind of hard to use the other one. It's like, everything, I already know how to split, you know, everything's in order. So, but in this beautiful, (laughs) in this beautiful book, Closing the Gap, I want to point something out. It says on page 47, what page? 47. Which book? Closing the Gap. Gap. This is one of my favorite parts in this whole book. I love this part. And if, if, And I'm pretty sure I I use this part multiple times through the year when I speak. It says, For a law God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He gave, he sacrificed him. And the son was willing to be sacrificed. I have no life of my own. My life is for the redemption of a people and that is pretty hard. However, that is the necessary requirement to effect resurrection, redemption, restoration, and reconciliation of the soul that is lost. Now, I want you all to roll with me. This is the part I really want you to pay attention to. In conclusion, when a person is like that, he has no sin. He has shortcomings for sure, and he may commit sin, but by him, 
excuse me, by his long suffering and continuing to pull on the good nature of Allah, God, in the people to make them better and better and better, Allah, God, just wipes away sin. What does he do? He wipes away sin that he has and throws it into the sea of forgiveness and he uncovers his sin. Because of the work that he does of redemption, this is why Jesus is looked at as absolutely perfect and sinless. Why did I want to read that? Why did I want to read that? Because we all have shortcomings. We've all committed sins. We've all done things that we know that is not in our nature. That's why when you do good, you don't remember the good that you do. But if I say, remember that one bad, oh, brother, I remember that one time I did this right. But as long as we're striving day in and day out to do better, do better, and do better in our purpose in life, whatever those shortcomings are, whatever those sins are, God will forgive us of them. He will take them and throw them into the sea of forgiveness. That means if we do that, if we continue to keep pushing forward, yes, I made a mistake. Yes, I mistreated people. Yes, I lied. Yes, I've done things I should not do. But God, I'm striving to be a better person today. That's right. yes. And as long as we're striving to be a better purpose person, that leads us to our purpose. God forgives us of our sins. Yes, right. And our brothers and sisters who we've done wrong at some point, God will soften their hearts. And they'll forgive us of our sins and our shortcomings. So we ride that into 2 Timothy 1 and 7. It says, for, it says, for God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Yes. So as our eyes open, as our heart open, as our mind opens, we start growing into true power of who we really are. We start growing into what love really looks like. We develop discipline, so now we have self-control over our indecencies. And then, as we continue to do that, now we start to move into the direction of a life remembered. So instead of it being a life not remembered, it will become a life remembered so people know who we were when we lived. Allahu Akbar. Now, we're not saying this out of vain desires. We're not trying to boast ourselves up so people, yeah, 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 that, he was the man. No. Humility. Being the best you. That is who we're striving to be. So let's take a moment. Let's take a moment. And I want you to think about what legacy you want to leave behind. Take that moment. I'm going to pause because I want you to take a moment on that. Think about how you want to be remembered. Think about where you are in life. Think about where you want to be at in life. Did you find something? Some of you did. Some of you may not have. It's okay. The ones who did not find some, it just means that that's how far removed we have been from our purpose in life. That's all it is. So all we have to do, if that is the case, is we just take some time every day. Take a few moments and just think about life. Where do I want to be at in life? Who do I want to be in life? How do I want to be the greatest me? That God wants me to be. How do I fulfill my purpose in life? And the more we start doing that, we start coming into that aha of that's who I want to be. And once we get there, now we can find out and we can start fulfilling and working the purpose in life. Because once we understand that, now we can start removing the old ways of us and we start taking a different direction and we start yeeting and heeding new results in life. Because if we continue to go the same way we were going, once we find our purpose, that means we are committing what? Insanity. If we find who we should be in life and we continue to be that same Negro we was being, 
thinking it's going to heat new results. That's called insanity. That means we might need to be wrapped up in a white jacket. And I don't want that for my brothers and sisters. No white jackets, please. No white jackets. So you have to, in order to do that, you have to be willing to try new things. If you think about the things we've been doing, is it working? Eh. If it's not working, what do we do? We try new things. If you were doing a mathematical equation, you took it from one direction, and you can't get the answer, what do you do? You take a step back, you rearrange it, you go another direction. I got this game I, my, my daughter's put on my phone. I don't even know what it's called. Hold on. I don't even know what it's called. It is water sort puzzle. Hold on. Y'all see it? Y'all can see Okay. The goal is to get all the colors to fill in each one of these things right here, right? Yes. Now, when I'm playing, I'm pretty good at it. At least I think so. I'm, I'm, I just started. I'm already 100 and something. But I've had to refresh a few times. And all, to, all my gamers, some days you got to like, oh, sh reset, reset. That, that method didn't work. So I had to learn to reset, readjust. Okay, I can't go green, green, blue, here, there. I Maybe mean, I need to go red, pink, purple. And then as I start maneuvering, you start seeing things open up, and it's, it becomes a smoother ride to the finish line. So if we're running into a whole bunch of obstacles in life right now, that means what should we do? Take a step back. Reassess it. Be like the birds and fly above to look down on an aerial view of what we're dealing with and see Oh, there's something right here that's impeding this. Now, do I go work this or do I take the longer detour to my purpose? Because sometimes that thing that's impeding us could be friends and family yeah. right. who are comfortable with us being the way we are. Our family doesn't always want to see us grow because us growing exposes that they may not be growing. Uh oh. Uh oh. Y'all don't beat me up after this. <laughs> So, you have to try new things. And you have to be willing to try these new things. You can't just fight them. Because these new things create new thinking. And new thinking creates a new spirit. And new spirit creates a new outlook on life. A new outlook on life creates new goals. New goals create new accomplishments. And then we get to the point, as long as you're keeping God in the center, you keep getting closer to God as you're growing into these new accomplishments. Then we'll get to the point, I'm pretty sure it's down here, but I want to say it now. We'll get to the point that when, when they talked about uh, the, the, the elders and the children of Israel said there were giants out there, I bear witness to what I'm about to say right here. God is my witness over the last couple of years. I made a prayer. I said, a lot. I'm going to step out on faith more. I'm not saying that I'm ready, but I'm saying that I'm willing yes. to strive to do better. Yes, and as I started stepping out on faith, I would, I would see a lot give me an idea, and I'm like, oh, you want me to do that? Come on. Yes, That's huge. Giants. Yes, but step out. <laughs> and I would go out and do that, which I was afraid of. I have fear too. I would look down and say, where's the giants? They were little kittens. Boy. Little kittens. Those things you think you're afraid of, I challenge you. Yes, challenge them. And watch how small and minute that little fear is. Yes, and the more we step out, you will find yourself becoming more bold. Because yes, yes, you know God got you wrapped. Yes, and you start stepping out. I don't know, fear like this ain't nothing. You look at big, I want to take off to the mountain. You start stepping over mountains. And you look and say, why was I afraid of these things? Because I allowed somebody to make me afraid of them. Oh, Allah. I don't think I heard what I just said right there. I don't think I, I wrote a book through the grace of Allah. I was afraid to write a book. But it happened. I looked up and said, Lord, this is what you want me to do? I said, I need to lose weight. I looked at a picture of me and my father's Janah. I said, oh, I was in my FY uniform looking like that. I was not representing. My, my legs about to bust through my pants. 
I said, oh, no, sir. I looked at my father's life, and I said, man, I don't want to be in his position at that age, and I don't want my children to experience what we experienced. So I, so I went to a law that turned me into one meal every other day. If it be the will of Allah, I've had some, I've had some slip ups. I've had some struggles with it. But overall, if we look at it, if it be the will of Allah, it'll be two years in August. Allah yes, oh. Akbar. I'm just, I'm just putting this out there as examples of stepping out on faith. I stepped away from my nine to five. I haven't been back in over a year. And through the grace of Allah, we ain't missed one bill. Yes, one bill. And trust me, I wasn't trying to walk away from the nine to five. <laughs> I was comfortable. But Allah gave me a nice little punt. And I had to get up and maneuver with it. It may require more work hours. It may require me to adjust more. But through the grace of Allah, he will do it for each and every one of us. So as we continue to step out on faith, you will start becoming more spiritually heightened. What does it mean to become spiritually heightened? That means you'll pick up the energy of your brothers and sisters. You have to protect your energy even more because you can feel their pain even more. You'll become so spiritually heightened that you'll pick up the signs of Allah. You will go to your prayer rug and make a prayer and ask for something. And before you get to the car, you'll start seeing the answers coming. And even if you don't see them at that point, as you maneuver through the day, you'll say, there goes a sign. There goes a sign. There goes a sign. And now you're like, confirmation. My brother going to let us part. Confirmation, affirmation. Then you will start seeing the answers of your questions sooner. You will start moving out on faith more than you did in the past. You will start building your legacy beyond your grave. Go ahead. Go ahead. Now I want you to understand everyone around you is not going to support you. Go ahead. Because you're going to start moving at light speed. And people like to be above people at times. People like to be over people at times. But once you maneuver, you will start passing people up, not speaking negative of them, but you'll start seeing how a law is using you. I'm not boring y'all, am I? Okay. But as you make that move, and as you have those who may be pulling at you, who may be trying to draw your spirit, because a leech will draw the spirit of a host. And when a God gives this host some real spirit, others want to attach to that spirit. So when that happens, you must put on the whole armor of God. You must get your helmet of salvation. You must carry your sword of spirit, your shield of righteousness, your feet covered with the gospel. So everywhere you move, they will know that's God's man. That's God's woman right there. And when I say that's God's man, that's God's woman, that means they see a person who's on a mission striving to fulfill their purpose in life. So you are, excuse me, you were, you were the one in those shoes and you will be the one that people will look at as an example because you was in the shoes of the person who did not see their purpose in life. <sighs> For those brothers and sisters who've come into the nation before, who's in the ranks, you went home and you spoke so highly of the nation. And your brothers and your sisters and your friends and family, they spoke negative of it. They didn't want you to be part of this. And you're like, huh? Did you not hear what they, what they said? And then what they started doing, they may have fell back a little bit. But what they really was doing, pulling on some binoculars, they were watching you closely. And they started watching the example you were becoming. They may not say nothing, but then they may start making mockery or fun of you. That's their way of acknowledging you. Because they see you growing into a new man, a new person. Yes, sir. And it's not that they're jealous of it. They're dealing with their own fear. Right. And they're afraid to step out. So as you and I get comfortable in who we are, what do we do? We, do, we leave no man behind. 
We leave no woman behind. We reach back to our brother and our sister. And we pull them up with us. So that they too can find their purpose in life. Allah hu Akbar. These obstacles are war wounds to remind you of your journey to greatness. So I tell you, never give up. Our enemy has built statues for his legacy. He wants to be remembered by these statues. He wants you to know he was here. That we don't need no statues. We need tangible gains. What is a tangible gain? We need land. Y'all didn't hear what I just said? We need land. We need businesses. That's our tangible gains. We need homes. We need a community. That's what we prepare and we fulfill. We produce our own heaven here on earth. And we separate ourselves from an enemy who's trying to plant seeds on us. Man, we need to leave something that our family our community and our nation can call their own. Wishing there was something to do, huh? Is that what it is? We wish we had something to do, huh? Go ahead. But I tell you, there's always something to do. That's right. We are a nation that is still in development. Y'all hear what I said? We have a nation that, we're a nation, we're still in development right now. We need your help. Muhammad needs your help. He needs your skills. If you know these beautiful, hard-working laborers we have, they can't think and do everything. They're not supposed to. But a free mind covers down in the areas that needs to be covered down in. Oh, yeah, I didn't hear what I just said. A free mind covers down in the areas that need to be covered down in so our laborers don't have to think about those areas. When we see a gap, we fill the gap. That even goes on in life. See, the beautiful thing about a marriage. Can I speak on a marriage real quick? You know, through, if it be the will of Allah, I'll make 13 years this year. Man, some days I do. Allah, who I and, and I want you to understand, it, it does this. Marriages do this. You have your ups and downs, your peaks and rivers, your, you got your days, you got your back to each other, y'all don't want to talk to each other. But I tell you this, when you are, when you are truly equally yoked, the husband and the wife complement each other's weaknesses. Right. That's right. That's right. So that means the wife doesn't have to worry about these areas she struggles in because the man got her back there. And the man, as he's taking on the world, he ain't got to worry about his weaknesses because the women got him covered there. Yes, and then as you're doing that, you become a strong unit. Yes. Unit T. Y'all didn't hear that. that I left y'all on that one. Yes, Let me run that back real quick. Unit T. If you bring us together as a nation, you bring us together as a collective, and we're covering down in each other's weaknesses, that is what you call unity. We become a strong unit that can go out into this world and conquer anything with the right mind and the right purpose. And that becomes part of your legacy. Oh, Allah. Please forgive the passion, believers, family. But I love you so much, and I want to give you everything Allah puts on me. If you still don't know what to do with your skills, I'll tell you who does, Mr. Muhammad. You come run into these ranks, Mr. Muhammad will find something to do with your skills. See, what we are speaking on right now is real love. True love. So when I say I love you, which I do, see that word love, I love you, it's a three-letter word, it's a a three-letter sentence. But the word love is placed in the position of a verb. And a verb is an action word. So when you say I love you, then it's what have you done for me lately? When you say I love you, that means there's action that must be produced out of that love. So when you're looking to build a legacy, the legacy is built out of love because you're leaving something behind showing your family 
community, the love for your nation will produce the duty and requirement needed. So to my brothers, that love will produce the environment for women and children to become giants out of it. Oh, man, I feel like I'm talking to myself today. Boy, no, I feel like I'm talking to no, myself sir. today. No, sir. We're taught in the nation of Islam that 75% of the work is on the woman. That's right. Well, the woman can't produce her 75 if we as men don't produce the 25. That equals 100. That 25 is us producing the environment yes, that she can be a giant out of. Right. So if she doesn't have to use her masculine genes. Oh, Allah. Man, forgive me. I mean, I'm... We're trying to build a legacy beyond the grave today, brothers and sisters. The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan said this, the home is not a woman's place. Uh-oh, sisters ready for this one. They love this line. They, the sisters know this one too well. It's her base. Her place is wherever her gift will take her if she is free. If she's what? Free. If she's free to, oh, lost my point, lost my point. If she's free to be who she really is. That's true. Brothers, Brothers, we help establish that place where our women can have a strong base. We help establish that place so she can be free. There, there's been a lot of arguments and disagreements between men and women lately. Men is this, women is that. We arguing, we beefing, we, we talking about each other. But I tell you one thing, brothers, if you produce in the right home for your wife, you ain't got no arguments at home like that. Right. Brothers, if you produce in the right home at your wife, you ain't got to worry about not having a home-cooked meal when you get home. That's That's right. Right. When, you, when you produce in the right base for your wife and you allow her to be free within that environment, you, you get foot massages and back rubs and head Oh, I might be going too far for y'all right now, huh? <laughs> You come home to a peaceful environment with candles lit and essential oils and, and, and the children are running to you screaming out, Daddy, Daddy, Father, Father, and the stress of the world just leaves you. That's right. See, that's part of building your legacy, brothers. How do we build a legacy when, 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 when marriage is half your faith but we refuse to get married? Oh, man, I wasn't even trying to go there today. Let me leave that there. Let me leave that there. Y'all don't see me after. I ain't look. Y'all trying to get me jumped after the meeting, man. Please, let me leave that there. Let me leave that there. A woman that knows her man is established in a strong base and a loving place will do everything in her power to help you build your legacy. She knows your legacy is also her legacy. You just say that again? Okay, you all sure y'all want to hear it again? Yeah. All right, all right, all right, all right, I'm just saying. Since, since Aisha got my back, right? You ain't gonna let her run up on me, all right? Brother Sam, you ain't gonna let her run up. Okay, thank you, Chief. A woman that knows her man is establishing a strong base, a strong base, and a loving place will do everything in her power to help you build your legacy. She knows. Your legacy is also her legacy. That's true. Your legacy is also her legacy. She is submitting to you that you're going to build something for us. So she knows whatever you go build is not just for you, but it's for the whole body. So there is no great man without a great woman. Not behind him like this enemy has painted the picture. There's no great man without a great woman by his side. Yes, we don't, in the nation of Islam, we don't walk with a woman five feet behind us. She walks by our side maybe one step behind. And that one step is really for security measures. Because yes, yes. I don't need you in front of me, but I need to step, up, step into something. Right. So your legacy does this. In Psalms 145 and 4, our generation shall, our one, excuse me, one generation shall commend your works to another, 
and shall declare your mighty acts. As we get ready to start landing this plane, I want to say this. This legacy beyond the grave. I want to take a quick moment to kind of give you an idea of what inspired me to continue the, met, the direction I'm going in life right now. Many know we're coming up on three years since my father made his transition. And one of the things that really sparked me was seeing my father in that hospital taking his last breaths. And I just thought about the things he wanted to accomplish in life that he did not get to accomplish. And I sit here and I reflect all the time on this. I wonder if he had any regrets for what he couldn't do in life. And I sit there and I talk to myself. I do, I do talk to myself, so you understand. I enjoy it. I, I answer too. I answer too. Okay. You said me too. Good call. So those will be my best conversations too, so you understand. So. I started reflecting on that, and I said to my, you know, talking to myself, I don't want to be in that position where I have regrets in life. Right. I don't want to sit there and be taking my last breath and, and, and thinking about the things I wanted to do. Listen, come on. Go ahead, brother. I wanted, I mean, wanted to do, not even need to do, just wanted to do. You, you want to stop and get some ice cream on your way home, but you don't do it. You wanted to do that. So from that day forward, I started through the grace of Allah, through his permissive will, yeah. moving out more on those things. Yeah. Now, we know in the world they got, they got something called a bucket list. Right. And this is usually yeah. something you start on when yeah. you know you're about to die. Yeah. Yeah. But what if I told you to go home and create a bucket list and to start working your bucket list now, yeah. right now? You'll be surprised on how fast you can really run through that bucket list. Right. You'll look up and say, oh, check, 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 right. check. I need a new bucket list. Right. Then you'll create a new bucket list right. that's a little bit more challenging. Right. Check, 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 check. I need another bucket list. And you will find yourself fulfilling the things that make you happy in life. Yes. Right. And as you're traveling, you're on these journeys, you're checking off these goals that are on your bucket list. Yes. See, right. sometimes we have goals, but these ain't goals we really want. But a bucket list is a goal you really wanted to do. Yes. So now that you're checking them off, that giant out there which was on that bucket list becomes a kitten. Yes. It becomes a notch on the belt. It becomes something easy to achieve. So now when it be the will of Allah, that your time for your body to go back to the earth. You may be laying in your bed or in the comfort of your home and you're reflecting on your life. And you're looking back and instead of having regret, you are rejoiceful. Because you know you lived a purposeful life. You know that you lived a life so abundantly and you know you left things behind and you were an example for those around you. Right. Oh, yeah, that they started traveling. They started knocking off their bucket list. They started doing things in life because of the impact Allah used you to be for them. Mm. Oh, Allah. 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 I'm telling you, brothers, sisters, if there's one thing I want you to take away, go do that when you get home today. Put that list together and do not allow anyone to stop you from achieving it. Yes, that's right. And watch how as you maneuver through it, Allah will give you such a free spirit that you will see everything starts to become easy to overcome. Yes, that's right. You no longer carry the weight of this world. We're taught that there will be a period that the enemy will be wrapped around our pinky. And we'll forget that he even exists until we look down at it. Well, when you're moving in the purpose of your life, like this man Farcom moves, you will find yourself.
complaint. <laughs> Thank Allah for that one. Oh, Allah. Boom, boom, boom. Boom, boom, boom. I said that part. Okay, this is where we're at. Okay, see? Y'all supposed to help me get here faster. <laughs> when you are taking your uh, tip shot, see? I hit that part. I hit that part. All praises be to Allah. What time have you been given to? Oh, oh, yep, hit that part. Allah tied it all together. If we go to, as we're landing this plane and we're preparing our own legacy, if we go to Proverbs 13 and 22, it says, A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, but the sinner's wealth is laid up for the righteous. Then if we go to Psalms 112, 1 through 3, it says, Praise the Lord. Blessed is the name who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. His offsprings will be mighty in the land. Got to hear that part. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. Think the work we're doing today is not for us. It's not for us. It's for the generation after us. But why not reap some of the benefits of it? Right. Proverbs 17 and 6. Grandchildren are the crown of the age. So young brother, you, you, did you catch that? What did I say? Alright, we'll, 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 we'll work with that. We'll work with that. Grandchildren are the crown of the age, and the glory of the children is their fathers. So, brother, that means that you are growing up from whatever your grandparents did. Whatever they left you is what you have to work with. But if you don't have anything like an orphan doesn't have anything, it is the obligation of the brother and the sister to cover down and to make sure you got what you need, yes, brother. Sir. So that you don't have to take on this world by yourself. Yes, and this sir. is what you have right here. You have a family yes. here to help you grow into the greatness you're supposed to grow yes, into. That's right, Allahu Akbar. Allah. Then we go to 3 John 1 through 4. Or I'm sorry, 3 John 1, 1 4. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in truth. That's for the parents. That's what we, that's what we do this for. Right. The grandparents, that's what we do this for. Yeah. To make sure we're the example that our children are able to walk whatever we left. We're passing on the torch for yeah, them. That's right. I mean, I got a simple. Would you be willing to give your life today if it was a guarantee your grandchildren were making it to the hereafter? Yes sir. Yes, sir. yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's what we're doing now. Yes. We're preparing that so that our children can reap the benefits of our labor. Yes. So our fallen soldiers, that's what they did. They laid themselves out that we can reap the benefits of their labor. Yes. So we have work to do, brothers and sisters. 2 Timothy 2 and 2. Excuse me, 2 Timothy 2, yeah, 2 and 2. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses in trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Your legacy beyond the grave is the impact that you will leave and you will have for those around you that as you move on, they will reap the benefits of it. These obstacles that we endure during this process, these obstacles that we're going to have to handle, these obstacles that we have to overcome, don't even stress them. All they are are flesh wounds. All they are are war wounds. If you ever played a sport or you ever got an injury, you will tell your stories about them as flesh wounds, as war wounds of some encounter you had in life. But picture this. Now walk with me. Walk with me. Walk with me. Picture this. Your legacy will help lead God people into the promised land. So the work you do today will open up the doors for those to come behind you to go into the promised land. That's right. Your legacy, listen to me. Grandparents, parents, listen to me. Your legacy will be bedtime stories. 
for future generations in the hereafter. Let me tell you about Sister So-and-So and the work she did. That would be what gives ease to the baby when they're going to sleep at night. Let me tell you about Brother So-and-So. He was a soldier. And the work he did is why we're here today. They will go to bed with smiles on their face, with confidence in their heart, knowing that I'm going to be like that man, that woman when I get older. Because that's what we're doing today. So go be great, brothers and sisters. Go be the greatest man. 